with the Federal Reserve signaling that it is done raising interest rates. What does this mean for markets and which markets in particular may do best during a Fed pivot environment? Joining us to discuss this is Martin Pelletier. He is a senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. He is a weekly columnist with the Financial Post, and he has won the Black Rock Award for Canadian Portfolio Discretionary Manager of the Year in 2019. First, a word from our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space, including unique tax benefits. So if you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or consider rolling over an existing account, click on the link down below at itrust.capital slash David to learn more. Martin, it's good to see you. Welcome to the show. Oh, you betcha. It's nice to uh, be able to participate. You've got more than 20 years of experience in the investment industry. Have you ever seen a time like this when the Fed has risen rates so quickly and so much in a short amount of time, and now they're signaling three cuts by next year? Is this or is this normal? Um, well, the last three years have been anything but normal. Um, it's, it's been a very challenging market and one heck of a roller coaster ride. So, you know, you have a lot of people cheerleading uh, the big rally in tech this year. Um, but they were certainly quiet last year when you had a, a, a significant correction. So, you know, getting back to zero doesn't make you a hero <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so, no, it's been a very challenging time. And uh, you've had uh, the shutdown of the global economy, which you haven't experienced since World War II. Um, then you have uh, supply constraints. Then you had the, the, the on the restart. And then you had the surge in inflation and commodity prices. Then you had the collapse in, in commodity prices back down again. And, uh, and then you had the rapid rise in interest rates that we have never witnessed at the, at this pace before. And, uh, and and so now, you know, pundits are extrapolating a rapid decrease in interest rates back again. And so that's wreaked havoc on all areas of the market uh, on the duration side, especially in fixed income. And uh, and so that's made it very challenging for investors, but um, also uh, more more recently, the the rise in rates have been welcomed by retired people with uh, looking at, uh, at at finally getting something on your in your bank your bank account. And the uh, we'll come back to uh, the um, bond market and the 60 40 portfolio in just a bit. Uh, but I want to talk about the Fed for now. In the news conference yesterday at the press conference, Powell said that recent indicators suggest that growth and economic activity has slowed substantially from the outsized pace seen in the third quarter. Even so, GDP is on track to expand around 2.5% for the year as a whole. He was referring to, of course, the U.S. economy. Is this an outlook that you share that the economy will continue to expand into 2024 and beyond? I do. I'm not in the bear camp that we're going to see a recession um, in the U.S. anyway. I think Canada, there, there's much greater likelihood for, for some different reasons. Uh, the, the U.S. doesn't have as, as, sensitive, as great a sensitivity to interest rates as other jurisdictions. And the uh, main reason is, uh, if you look at households, uh, they have their, their mortgages termed out for 30 years. And, and so there was a, something called the great COVID refinancing boom, $450 billion of, of mortgages refinanced for 30-year terms at, you know, sub 2% rates. So they're sitting back and saying, well, you know, I, I don't have to worry about my mortgage costs going up so I can afford to cover some of these higher grocery bills and, and everything else. Um, and which are coming that back down again. So, you know, you look at commodities uh, themselves, you know, they're, they're, they're selling off. And so now you have an economy that is resilient with, with major components of the inflationary aspect of primarily being commodities selling off heading into, into next year, just setting up for another good economic uh, year for, for the U S. Okay. I'm just, just out of curiosity because we're, both currently based in Canada. Why do you think that Canada's economy will fare less well? A, a couple of things. Um, our household debt levels are significantly higher. And uh, and then if you look at including total public debt, I know the, the federal government's deficit spending is, is quite pronounced, but not as large as the U.S. But when you include the federal, provincial, and municipal debt levels, it's also uh, among the highest in G7. And so uh, we have a greater sensitivity to interest rates. And and so, I mean, if you let's look at housing and, and mortgages, the average is the, the longest term people go out is five years. And uh, we have in the next three, four years, $900 billion of 
mortgages coming up for renewal and that's starting to accelerate into the early 2024. And so um, that will have a significant impact on households. And I don't think they have the capacity to, uh, to, to take on that kind of higher debt cost. So the Bank of Canada is going to have to respond sooner than the Federal Reserve. So I guess you're thinking then the Canadian dollar will weaken if interest rate differentials widen? Great question. Um, I've been giving a lot of thought about that more recently. Um, there's a, also a strong correlation. It's weakened more recently, but there there is in regards to oil prices and, and our currency, if you go back enough. And, 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 and so we haven't capped oil and gas production yet. I know the federal government is aggressively trying to do so. Um, but fortunately, they haven't been able to as of yet. And so that means is that as uh, we can continue to, to grow our oil production, it should provide a, a floor or a hedge on our on the on the Canadian dollar. So, um, yeah, there would be down, some downside uh, to that. But if the Fed delivers at the same pace the market's expecting, that's a real big sigh of relief for the Bank of Canada. Okay, well, let's shift back to the Fed and talk about the U.S. interest rate uh, environment. So uh, the Fed signaled three cuts next year. I'm looking at the Fed Watch tool, which is by the CME group, which uses the futures to project probabilities. Uh, the market's actually being a little bit more aggressive in pricing and cuts. So by January 2024, uh, it's looking at uh, at a no, no cut scenario, so 81% of no cut by January. But by March, we're looking at a 64% chance of one cut to 500 to 525 basis points by by May uh another 57% chance but of one more cut down to 475 by June uh another 56% chance of one more cut down to 450 and then by July another 50% chance of uh, one more cut by uh to 425 so you know the probabilities are overwhelmingly in three to four cuts by next year do you think that's likely that we're going to get four cuts in 2024 well, I think the bond markets are factoring in those four cuts. If you look at long duration equities, it's more like six or seven cuts. And uh, and, and so um, I, I, I don't see, um, you know, certainly don't see six cuts, but, you know, getting interest rates down to the, where the 10 year is at 4% probably does make some sense uh, given uh, the, the economic response and the, and, and the drop in inflation. And so, yeah, I mean, I could see, you know, three, uh, the four cuts uh, next year, and uh, that would bring the Fed rate down to, uh, you know, four, four and a quarter. And, and, you know, and if inflation settles down, realistically, I mean, we have the base uh, effect. So year over year, it's going to, we may actually see a, a resurgence in inflation. Um, so, you know, if, if you're running pretty close to where the inflation rate is at, um you know, I think that would provide better direction as to where rates are at. But definitely you're going to be you're going to see, thankfully, uh, some lower interest rates next year. So that's the key that you touched on inflation. Officials at the Fed have signaled that they're willing to hike rates again if inflation flares up significantly. So what, what are the problem? What are the chances of that happening? I don't see that happening, barring there being a um, some sort of event that would cause um the supply to be uh, on the supply side to be challenged. Um, uranium with Russia, um, you've got oil and gas in the Middle East. So you've got some some risks that are not being factored into it. Um, but overall, I, I think that the commodities are reflecting a, a, a little bit of a, a reduced economic outlook, certainly not a, in, in some cases, a, a recessionary outlook in, in oil, in my, in my opinion. But um, I, I think that we're not going to see a, a, a huge surge in inflation for uh, for next year that would cause the Fed to to hike, like they mentioned. Okay, uh, Chair Powell said that uh, inflation has eased from its highs, and this has come without a significant increase in unemployment. Uh, I stress the word significant because unemployment has increased somewhat uh, from its lows uh, earlier in the year. Do you think that unemployment will be a concern next year? In other words, do you think this rate of unemployment, 3.9%, the latest reading in the U.S., will rise significantly more into 2024? No, I don't. Um, and if you look at, at COVID as, as to it being a structural shift in the market, 
Um, there's a lot of things that are different now than they were pre-COVID. And to assume that we're going back to the way things were pre-COVID is, in my opinion, just if setting yourself up for some risks. And what I mean by that is I work from home. Um, you know, they're trying to get people to to come into the office. I forget which who who it was, but um, people are resigning and leaving their job rather than uh, being forced to go back to the work uh, workplace four days a week. And you're seeing that on the strikes as well too that we we've, we've witnessed. And and so you've got that, and and that's just telling you that uh, that labor market is pretty strong. That someone would be willing to quit their job um, to be able to stay and work from home. Then there's implications from work from home in itself. So, you know, it, it is a little bit different than, or it could be quite a bit different. And then if you look at baby boomers, uh, they've accelerated their retirement out of, uh, um, out of COVID and traveling and, and doing, you know, their, their YOLO experience. And so um, now you've got a whole swath of people leaving the workforce that were qualified, very skilled. And so there's a shortage of, of skilled labor and finally, um, that's going to put a demographic profile such that uh, younger people can start demanding higher wages. And uh, I don't think we've seen the wage supply response, the wage response, sorry, that that are showing up in the numbers yet, I think is a leg. And I think that's where we could see some uh, some worries about inflation. And, uh, and and all of a sudden now we have, you know, next year, uh, a material increase in, in wages. And that's something we're going to have to keep a close eye on in the next couple of years. One narrative or theory that I've heard throughout the year is that a lot of companies in the U.S. Uh, are going to face financial difficulties because of how high their interest expenses could go if, let's say, they have to refinance at current rates. Keep in mind, a lot of people financed before rates rose the way they did. Certainly, we've seen a surge in bankruptcies amongst, um, amongst the um, mid-cap companies this year. Mass bankruptcies, is that a concern for you next year? Not at all, because if you look at total net uh, interest exposure, um, it's actually better than it was uh, pre-COVID. And the reason being is uh, a lot of companies, even big ones like Apple, turned out their debt, um, you know, did 30-year plus uh, uh, debt issuance at very low rates, and they have cash and a lot of cash on hand. So which they're being paid, you know, five over five percent on, and their term debt is down to two or below two. Um, so that chunk of cash they're they're generating interest on is greater than the the debt, and so their net servicing costs are down. So yeah, there's going to be some challenges in certain segments of the market, um, especially if you have to, if like on the banking side, and uh, you're looking at your long treasury exposure and having to reprice that. Um, could create some challenges like we saw with soft uh, with um, Silicon Valley Bank. But I mean, look at look at uh, long data treasuries. They're having a heck of a run the last couple of months. So that's going to put uh, remove a lot of the pressure. So I don't see that being uh, I mean, these interest rate drops couldn't come at a better time. And uh, and so we're we're pretty well cushioned to to get through that. So we don't see the little bankruptcies. Yeah, there'll be some who, who misbehaved. That are going to be punished and took on too much debt and floating rate debt. But um, I don't see that being a, a broader economic systemic risk. All right. Well, let's uh, turn to the uh, broad uh, market indi indices. Now, the S&P 500 currently at 4,700 points is at the highest level this year in 2023. Now, like you said, it's pricing in multiple rate cuts, maybe even six or seven. Isn't the market setting itself up for disappointment at current levels? If you're if you're looking at this and saying to yourselves, well, investors are pricing in a lot of cuts, it may or may not happen. Um, you know, How much room do we have to climb from here is my question. Things are, are, are no doubt looking a little frothy. You've got almost 50% of the S&P 500 uh, with an RSI greater than 70. So it's the most overbought we've seen in 10 years. And uh, and so there's some concern from that aspect. We've had uh, 11 consecutive years of new all-time highs. The only time that's ever happened before was 1989 to 2000. And uh, that was a 12-year period. And we know how that ended. <laughs> and then you've got growth stocks that are outperforming value stocks by 32%. And that's the second biggest upperformance on record. Um, and then finally, you've got uh, the VIX measure, uh, which has reached its November 2019 lows. And so on the broader S&P, yeah, things are looking a little bit 
um, over purchased here, and we could see a, a pullback. And I'm more concerned about the valuations on the mega and the, some of the big tech companies. That's what's keeping me, that's what would keep me awake at night for, for next year. There's been a hurting into, uh, into those companies. I also read that, for example, average retail investors in the U.S. have four stocks in their portfolio, and we know what they are. It's Microsoft, uh, Apple, Tesla, and, uh, and Google. And, and so, you know, there's a huge amount of buying into concentrated within those names. And, uh, and so if I'm going to be buying something and holding it for 10 years, like Buffett says, I probably wouldn't want to buy those types of companies and tuck them away for 10 years. Well, you know, what's been soaring up uh, recently is the Russell 2000 of the last three mm -hmm. days, really, it's just gone up in a straight vertical line. Do you think capital is flowing away from the large caps into yeah. the small caps? Is that what's happening? Um, it is among the institutional uh, money managers. I, I, from what we're seeing, the retail is is not not so much. Uh, the retail is still buying a lot of options. Options trading is up significantly, and FOMO purchasing uh, some of the bigger names. But um, some of the other, and I think we could see that accelerate into the early year, into the early 2024. Just looking at how I look at things and. If I've got a big capital gain, I'm probably nice to defer that a year. And uh, so maybe we start to see accelerated profit taking some from some of those bigger names in January and February next year. We've seen some tax loss selling in some of the weaker names. Um, and that's been probably going to cash. And I think that would that would be uh, uh, redeployed in, in the new year. So I, I would see that trend continuing early into the new year. Well, uh, even despite this pullback that may come, uh, the slight pullback of the S&P 500, do you expect this index to see new highs by next year, end of next year, let's say? I have no idea. <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase. Are the, are, the, are the economic conditions ripe for another bull run? Let's put it that way. Um, okay. So it all depends on the momentum and, and forward expectations. I look at things, again, if I'm going to buy something and hold it and tuck it away, um, where am I going to see that value? And so I give you the perfect example, and I wrote about this, Microsoft, um, outstanding company. Like there's no doubt about it. Very well run, very well diversified. It's got the, the moats, competitive moats. It's got everything going for it. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good stock. And so back in 1999, if you bought it and you looked at its cash flow growth and you held it through to 2012, it grew its cash flow by over 200%. So it did a really good job of, of, of delivering in, a, in, in that economic environment and benefiting from it. Um, and even despite the tech rollover, it was able to grow that, that free cash flow by 200%, free cash flow. The share price went down 50% over that period. Okay. The reason being is because you bought it at 50 times free cash flow multiple. And at, at 2012, it was an eight times free cash flow multiple. So you got the cash flow right, the economic outlook right, but the terminal value and judgment day when you sell it was walloped. Now, if you did the opposite, you bought it at eight times, 2012, and held it to now, okay, it grew its cash flow only by 130%, not 200, 130, yet the stock is up 12-fold. And so that's where you have to be a little bit careful about looking at what are you paying right now? So sure, they can deliver on the economic uh, aspect and, and benefiting from artificial intelligence and everything else. But if we get a multiple contraction and it's trading at the same multiple it did in 1999, so I'd rather own something that is trading at a lower multiple like that eight times. When I can't, there's very few companies trading at eight times free cash flow outside of energy. Um, and if they have a moderate cash flow growth, um, I get a multiple expansion at the end. That's the way I look at investing. I, I do want to finish off on oil, uh, but outside of energy, are any other sectors that are trading at a reasonable multiple right now? Uh, banks, for example, sold off a lot this year. I don't know from a cash flow to you know valuations perspective. I don't know if that's something that's fairly valued or maybe they're down for a reason. I'll let you answer that. So um, I, I think that any of the interest sensitive segments of the market like utilities have been hit pretty hard. Banks have been hit pretty hard. Uh, certain infrastructure components have been hit hard. And so there's been um, worries over their economic growth 
in addition to multiple contractions. And so as interest rates fall, okay, people will get more comfortable with the debt that they have on their books and the cost of servicing those debts and will buy those long duration assets. So I see that there being that there would be upside to those segments of the market. Uh, now that we've got some, I mean, they have rallied the last month or so, um, but I'd rather see that knife wobble in the ground and have some certainty around interest rate direction than try and uh, time the bottom and, and catch that falling knife. And so I, I think those components will benefit from, from falling interest rates to the extent of how much upside is there. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, double digits, you know, 10 to, to, to 20%. I mean, that wouldn't be unreasonable to see that kind of upside um, in the next 24 months. I understand bank sensitivity to interest rates, but why are utilities interest rate sensitive? I mean, you think about it, it's the demand is rather inelastic, is it not? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need utilities regardless of where the interest rate is at. Um, because they're more, number one, they're more of a defensive uh of a uh, sector that fund managers will own. And uh, we're not in that defensive segment of the of, of the market environment as of yet. Uh, number two is a lot of them have uh, a, a large amount of debt that they've taken on to build out large term projects. So you'd have to make sure that um, they are inflation uh, uh, protected on, on, on the other side so they can pass through along the cost, the higher cost of their commodities. And so uh, the benefit of this is now com their, some of their, their costs are, are dropping and their feedstock costs. And, uh, and and so you'll get that benefit in addition to the lower debt servicing costs. Okay, makes sense. Uh, now onto oil. You made a tweet yesterday. You said that now that the Fed confirmed that it is cutting rates soon and the economy is in, in a recession, can we start buying oil stocks again? <laughs> What's the relationship between the Fed and oil here? Help us out. Okay, so oil is about short duration as it can get. So your cash flow is so front end loaded, um, and 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 so you're going to get that cash flow now. And whereas you look at other segments like tech, it's about the terminal value and the cash flow is long dated, some promised growth in that cash flow. And so um, there's a lot of of speculators are trading seventy five percent of the commodity. A lot of producers are not hedging as much as they used to. Uh, certainly as the curve was in something called steep backwardation. So that means that the forward price is very, uh, very low compared to the, the current price. And so there isn't a lot of incentive for producers to do long-term hedging. And so that means that there's a lot of speculators trading it. So that's compounding the, the highs and lows. So there's a lot of momentum trading in it. And uh, the pervasive thought of the last couple of months is that we're going to be heading into a, a deep recession. And we've got an oversupply situation, especially coming out of the U.S., uh, despite uh, offsetting the uh, cuts by OPEC. And so there was a large material sell-off in, uh, in, in, in oil and oil stocks itself. Now, tying it back to the Fed, if the Fed is cutting interest rates, that's very stimulative uh, to the economy, right? And that will help the consumer. In addition to lower commodity prices helping the consumer, so you've got uh, a situation where we're not going to the risks of entering into a recession are going to be less um, in, a, in a as they cut interest rates than if they held pat or, or hiked. So maybe it's safe again to buy some of these these oil stocks, um, especially if you can get access to some of these free cash flows. You know, if oil prices stay where they're at. Uh, free cash flows at, it's in some of the mid caps are is at 15%. And uh, I haven't seen this kind of, and, and their balance sheets are very strong. So I haven't seen that kind of free cash flow in, in my career. Um, and so uh, the, the traders are factoring in a 50 or $40 oil price scenario to drop that free cash flow down to the more normalized rate. And I'm saying, well, what's going to cause oil to go to 40 or $50 if the economy's still chugging along and interest rates are lower. This doesn't make sense to me. Why is it that you think the um, OPEC plus countries are cutting, but the US isn't? Is there a difference in policy or outlook here? So um, what's, what's happening is, is that uh, OPEC is trying to support the front end of, the, of, that, of that curve. So they want to boost ne uh, near-term pricing. And, uh, and so the way they're doing that is by taking oil, taking barrels out of the market, up to 2 million barrels a day, 
And, uh, and, and so they've got control and ability to do that. At the same time, you've had a significant increase in, uh, or perceived significant increase. And I'll, I'll reason why I say perceived, I'll talk about it in a second, but um, we're seeing a, a large up to 800,000 barrels a day growth out of US shale producers. Now, uh, I don't believe in all of those numbers is probably more like three to 400,000 barrels a day, but uh, some of the traders and, and, and pundits who are negative on the commodity are saying, look at this top line number. So they're, they're giving up market share OPEC to uh, US shale producers. And so they're going to respond the same way they did in 2014 and flood the market with oil and crush these shale producers. And I just don't see that being a, a, a likely high, uh, a likely scenario playing out. Okay. Uh, well, given where oil is trading currently, which is significantly below its um, uh, highs in the fall, what do you think about oil stocks? Fairly valued or not? Um, no, there's, I mean, it's dependent on the large caps, especially the Canadian stocks have done very well. And they've been able to weather the storm. People have high graded their portfolios and get, went into excellent companies like C&Q. But there's also tremendous value in some of these mid caps, uh, mid cap oil, oil companies, especially here in Canada, that are generating a tremendous amount of, of cash flow, free cash flow, that um, in my opinion, should maybe not do dividends, they should be buying back their stock at these levels because they're trading at two times cash flow. And so I see there being a significant opportunity there. And I'm not always an, uh, in the oil market. Three years ago, we were almost zero weight. We had a, a massive underweight. And so we've been in the oil markets for three years. And so I've been buying, I've been uh, very positive the last three years, but being positive for three years doesn't make me a permable. And I'm always looking for a reason to sell. And uh, this last week was pretty gut wrenching. <laughs> I didn't hit that sell button, but I did see other people do it, and uh, and thankfully we did because we're having a nice two day rally here, and I think that's going to continue to to be the case in 2024. Well, are you surprised uh, that oil hasn't responded more positively to tensions in the Middle East? You know, we we saw a pop in the price as soon as uh, tensions broke out in Israel, but that didn't sustain, as you know, throughout October to November. It's continued falling. Um, maybe the oil market isn't pricing in an escalation, or maybe it just doesn't care where there's other factors involved. Uh, you know, we're seeing um, the uh, Houthis, or I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but, um, you know, they're they're attacking tankers and, and ships in, in the Suez Canal. And we're not seeing any, any response at all. Um, you have Russia, Ukraine, you're not seeing any response at all. You have uh, Iran, which is uh, under the Biden administration, um, has been allowed to increase production well beyond uh, the restrictions, but boosting production by 800,000 barrels a day. And so um, that in itself is offsetting, you know, some of the geopolitical risks, some of the supply uh, responses, cheating coming out of Russia, finding its way magically into India and Europe being branded as a different type of oil. Um, and so I, I think these Western governments are more concerned about having lower lower oil prices to help support them and, and their political uh, ambitions and, and turning a blind eye to uh, some of these not so favorable jurisdictions that are, are releasing oil in the market and then using that money to fund things like the attack that we saw in Israel um, using things to fund like the attacks we've seen within Ukraine. And uh, and so, hey, don't worry, we'll just we'll just increase our deficit spending and provide military funding to these nations. As long as we have low oil prices, that's OK. But maybe if we had higher oil prices and 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 these barrels were off the market, uh, we wouldn't see some of these geopolitical tensions. Yeah. Long term, do you see a bifurcation in the oil market globally? I, I ask this because countries like Saudi Arabia last year, uh, Saudi Arabia has said that it's willing to accept uh, prices uh, where payments in oil using Chinese yuan. Now, I don't know if this is actually being enacted currently, but uh, certainly a lot of companies, call it countries worldwide, are signaling their willingness to move away from the petrol dollar system. Potentially, we could see two different markets in the future. Is that possible? No. <laughs> no. no, okay. Not, not at all. The U.S. dollar is the U.S. dollar. Yeah. And nothing's changing that. I mean, you can't, you, you, why, like, no one's going to take that risk. And, like, it's it just, it's the world currency. And I don't see, everyone's been talking, well, you look at debt levels, you know, the Fed printing and all of that, you know, conspiracy type of stuff. It's still the U.S. dollar. 
And you compare it to it's, it's the best of all of the worst types of scenarios. I mean, it, look, productivity rate in the U.S., labor productivity is, is outstanding. Um, in Canada, it's terrible. Our labor productivity is, is, is if you rank all of the provinces against U.S. states, um, you only have Saskatchewan and Alberta. Alberta's 14th and Saskatchewan's 20th. And every other province is at the bottom. We're, I mean, we're like Alabama and Louisiana and, and like, I'm talking on, like, this is a, the biggest province is Ontario and they're worse than Alabama. And, and so we're going to buy Canadian dollars. No. And, and then if you look at labor productivity in other jurisdictions, the U S is still, you know, leading the charge. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's a different discussion in itself. Why uh, Canadian productivity and output is relatively low compared to the rest of the OECD countries. I, I don't know. Do you have a theory? Do, 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 is it something you've thought about at all? Yeah. Look at, look at black, Blackberry and Nortel. Yeah. That'll, that'll just tell you, I mean, we build up, I mean, we're the first, first country to invent ETFs in the seventies. And, you know, RBC was the last one to adopt it by doing BlackRock. That was a couple of years ago. So we, we just, we were early on in, in, on, like we have the, uh, the world leading research in artificial intelligence at the university of Alberta and Edmonton. How many AI companies do we have in Canada? Right. Is this so, just an issue of pay gap? Is this just because U S companies pay more? And so the brain drain goes South. I mean, if Canadian companies just paid more, this problem would fix itself. Is that it? Is it just as simple as that? No, I think we're a culture of complacency. So we get to a certain point where we're at and then we coast we're not continuing to innovate we're not continuing to like you look at apple despite how big they are they're con they're under tremendous pressure to keep evolving and adapting and and bringing new and exciting products to market and and they're they're all they have the same kind of drive that they did when they were half their size we get to a certain point and it's like okay well we're going to coast now and you can't have that mentality and and if you want to compete against the U.S. and do you know what I'll, I'll leave you I'll say something here is Alberta thirty percent of the of of the foundation of the population of Alberta comes from America, and and so we have thirty percent of our roots are American. Yeah. And so is there any coincidence that we're ranked number fourteenth overall? <laughs> I know we've got energy, um, but we're still number fourteenth. Yeah, it's a stereotypical Canadian niceness playing out in the markets and the economy. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end on this uh, question. So finally, how are you allocated uh, with your own fund and positioning um, uh, into 2024 in light of everything we've discussed so far? So what we do is we take what really helps remove bias and emotion um, from uh, from asset allocation. And that's very important because we're all we all have that embedded within us. And um, if you look at what's what's been successful, what's not, and then we end up comparing and benchmarking ourselves to other people or indices, it leads to things like buying at the highs and selling at the lows. And you don't want to do any of that. You want to buy good businesses and, and, and good investments for the longer term. And so what we try to do is something called goals-based benchmarking. It's big in the US. Uh, so we sit down with each client and uh, also who would be the typical purchaser of our balance fund. And, and they say, okay, uh, what kind of rate of return do we need to make them happy and minimize the level of risk? And so uh, we're targeting a five to 7% at, on average rate of return. And so we're not going to get those 20% lifts. We're also not going to get those 20% drops. So we look at investments that are going to be, be able to generate five to seven for the conservative investor and minimize the drawdown and the risk as much as possible. Now, you can't go in and buy GICs uh, for over 5% for greater than a year. So that's not really an option. So you have to look at some other alternatives. And so we're big into structured notes. Um, it's a uh, derivative overlay on top of an index, but it's it's structured as a bond. So it's backstopped by the credit worthiness of a Canadian bank. And that's getting us our five to seven um, with minimizing that downside because we've got embedded downside protection within that. So we can go as much as 100% principal protected. So that's about 40% of our portfolio. And that's been very well. Um, we're up 9% on that uh, structured note product uh, that, that we're creating uh, for our clients this year. And our standard deviation is half that of, 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 of higher risk, uh, higher yield uh, corporate bonds. 
So we have that. We have a small slice of, of energy. Um, we still have that. Um, it's about 10 to 13 percent right now. Um, that's a big overweight compared to the U.S. at 4 percent and an underweight compared to the TSX at 17 percent. We like owning that. We have some utilities and banks and uh, we're starting to look at long duration bonds um, now that we're comfortable about interest rates. So put all that together. Um, we think we can try and target that five to seven percent again for this for next year. We achieved it this year. We weren't uh, we were flat in the 20 percent market correction. And uh, and so if we can continue to, to do that, minimize those risks, it just helps. It's so nice to sleep at night and have, not have to worry about uh, about these huge swings that we're seeing. Excellent. And where can we learn more about your fund? Um, you can go on our website. Um, you can uh, find me on Twitter. Um, uh, and, uh, we also put out a monthly that you can sign up for, and, uh, you can just uh, reach out by, by Twitter or LinkedIn and happy to provide that. All right. We'll put the links down in the description below. So make sure to follow Martin. Thank you very much for your time today. You betcha. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.